Today we continue in our series on gifts. And it's a very important series because we need to understand what God has given us and because of what he's given us, what he's calling us uh, to do. Uh, we saw two weeks ago how God gives the gift of love. God gives the gift of love, and this is a, a gift for all people who receive it. Uh, last week we talked about the gift of law, and we understand that this was a unique gift given to a unique people, specifically the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. And we saw how that leads up to Jesus' law where we are to love God and love our neighbors. All fulfilled in that wonderful summary of Jesus. As I said, that was a specific gift given to a specific people. Today we're going to look at another specific gifts or gifts, plural, that are given to a unique people. Uh, these gifts are not given to all people. They're given to a unique people. Just as the law was given to the Jewish people, we find that the gifts that we're going to talk about today are given to the followers of Jesus, to the Christian people. And so if you're a follower of Christ, what you're going to hear this morning is a reminder or a lesson where you will discover that God has gifts for you. If you are not yet a believer, you're going to experience a wonderful look into the Word of God that tells you of the wonderful things that await you when you follow God. And so we are going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. What does that look like to have the gifts of the Spirit? The gift of love, gift of law, gift of Spirit. There are several passages in Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts and we're going to get to many of them this morning briefly, but I want us to mainly hang out in the book of Corinthians. This is a book written by Paul, uh, two Christians in Corinth, and a little background on this will help. Uh, he writes two letters, uh, as recorded in Scripture, to the Christians in Corinth. And what we find in this church that he's writing to is disruptive behavior. Uh, we find people who are following Jesus but often have a hard time getting along. Thus, that's why you find, for example, 1 Corinthians 13, which, by the way, is in the context of a discussion of spiritual gifts. We ask to remind them about love, that love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude, etc. He says this to a church that is struggling to get along. And in interestingly enough, one of the reasons they're not getting along is because they disagree on spiritual gifts. And so we need to make sure that we understand what Paul is trying to communicate here in Corinthians. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians, and we're going to begin in chapter 12. I'll be reading from the message version this morning. And in chapter 12, Paul says this. What I want to talk about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never, no, need, never knowing what you were doing, just going, doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek understanding as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would, not, would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus be damned. Nor would anyone be inclined to say Jesus is master without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is giving something to do that shows that who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. What I want us to do this morning is to look at the origin of spiritual gifts 
the recipients, in other words, who receives spiritual gifts and the purpose of spiritual gifts. What is the origin of spiritual gifts? Who receives the spiritual gifts and why? What, what's the purpose? Now, what we find in this text is a call to use our intelligence, to put our head in the game. Let me remind you of those verses, verses 1 and 2. What I want to talk to you about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is a complex and often, this is complex and often misunderstood. But I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek understanding as we as well as we can. So we're going to use our intelligence. We're going to put our head in the game. And we're going to discover this morning what does it mean to understand the spiritual gifts. Where do they come from? Who receives them? And why? So let's look, at, first of all, at the origin. I want to look at some of those verses. We find this in, chapter, in verse 1. What I want to talk to you about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked out in our lives. Verse 4. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. Verse 11. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. It is for good reason that we refer to the gifts as gifts of the Spirit. Because the simple answer and the accurate answer to the question of the origin of spiritual gifts is God's Spirit. In other words, we cannot gain these gifts by our effort. We cannot concoct these gifts in our lives. We cannot have these, these gifts given to us by another person. These are gifts given directly to the believer in Christ as the Spirit chooses. Look again at verse 11, the second half of it. It says this, He decides who gets what and when. We're, we're all familiar with the who, what, when, where, why type of thing. And, and this verse talks about it, that He understands who and what and when. So the Spirit looks upon each individual Christian and picks gifts for each individual Christian. Some of us receive the same. Many of us receive, di uh, receive different. So a who and then the what and the when. We're going to talk about this more. We're going to talk about these questions of who, what, and when. But we need to understand this who, which is the second part, this recipient. Who has the spiritual gifts? Look at verse 7. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. You're going to notice the words every person, everyone, and God gives to all, but not quite. Not quite. As I began this message, I, I told you that we need to understand the context. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He is writing to the church in Corinth. Now, what is the church? Uh, the church, by definition, is not the building. The church is not a organization. The church is a gathering of believers. And so, biblically speaking, the church, we welcome all people into the congregation to come together and to learn and to grow, but the actual people who, who, who constitute the church, as God sees it, are believers. And so let's remind ourselves who he's writing to. And to understand that, we go to the very beginning of the letter. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. He says, I, Paul, have been called and sent by Jesus, the Messiah, according to God's plan, along with my friend Sothenes. I send this letter to you in God's church at Corinth, believers cleaned up by Jesus and set apart for a God-filled life. I include in my greeting all who call on Jesus wherever they live. He's their master as well as others. Perhaps you've opened someone else's mail. I hope you haven't because I understand that's a felony. But if you open a letter and you do not see your name at the top, is it written to you? 
No. This letter is written to the believers in Corinth. And so each chapter throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, we understand all of the concepts, all of the truth, all of the teaching is targeted towards believers. And so we know when he gets to this discussion of spiritual gifts, and by the way, this occurs always in discussions of letters written to churches. And so he is saying, Paul is saying, these are words to believers. And so the Spirit gives them, but who does he give them to? He gives them to believers. I want to share some words from a man named J.W. McGorman. He says this, he says, just as there are no one-member churches, neither are there any every member gifts. Why, what's the importance of this? Importance of this. Uh, well, some people will be consumed with collecting as many gifts as they can. A scripture says that's not correct. A God has seen fit, as we have said, the Spirit decides who, what, when, where, why. And so the Spirit of God will give you, as Christians, gifts that fit you. There may be some gifts that you desire, but you may never receive them. Nor should you feel less than because someone has a gift you do not have, nor you, should you feel superior if you have one that someone else doesn't. Because in this same letter, Paul will use the illustration of the body. And isn't it funny that this idea of the body speaks so clearly to us? And why is that? Because we understand how our bodies work even if we're not physicians, even if we're not neurosurgeons and scientists, we understand how our body works because we pretty well work with it every single day of our lives. And I know that something in my brain right now is telling this finger to move. I thought Mark moved my finger, and therefore my brain moved my nerves, which moved my finger. Well, Paul goes into great detail about the body, and he says what happens sometimes is there is inferiority complex, and there is the arrogance that goes on. Now, the arrogance he's talking about is one, one, body, one part of the body says to the other part of the body, we don't need you. And perhaps you've been tempted to say this to part of your body, we don't need you. Well, God has put your body together, and you need every part. Interesting that people find out you actually need that spleen. I don't know why, but God put it in there. You actually need some of those things. And we can live without them, but the stronger we are, the more parts of our body are operating as they should. And so I encourage you to realize that this illustration that Paul is using is very apt because what he's saying is that just as our body, every part's needed, so in the church, every part is needed. And so God will look upon the hand of the church and the mouth of the church and the foot of the church and the head of the church and all parts of the church, and he will say, because you are the hand, because you are the foot, because you are the arm, because you are whatever, I'm giving you this gift for that purpose. We're going to get back to purpose in a little bit, but hold on to that note. God speaks to the hand. God speaks to the foot. God speaks to the ear. And he says, I give you this gift for the purpose of the body. Now, again, going back to the text, verse 11, he says, all these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the one spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. We move on now and ask this idea of what. Now, what are spiritual gifts? Now, there's a great number of, of gifts listed in Scripture. And as we read in the chapter, it says that this is often a complex and misunderstood topic. It's also a very argued topic. And I, I find that saddening because isn't it odd that when God gives us a gift, we tend to argue about it? That this is somehow ours to decide. Uh, I know this is God's to decide. And what we find is there's a great list of gifts. And if you were to go online and, and find different uh, understandings of gifts and list of gifts, you would understand that no one list matches another. Why is that? Because what Paul is doing, and others as well, is they're articulating gifts that apply to the audience to whom they're writing. And so there's no comprehensive listing of gifts within the Scripture. There are many gifts listed, but it is not a comprehensive list, listing of those gifts. But let's look at some of those passages. Let's look at chapter 12, verse 8 and 10. He says, all kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. 
wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Then verse 28, you are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your body as that body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in this church, which is his body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. And then we go to Romans chapter 12 to find more of these. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with a disadvantage, don't let yourself be irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. And then Ephesians chapter, f- chapter 4, beginning here in this verse, he says, He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher, to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we all, we're all we all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, evident, efficient, and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive, alive in Christ. What we find in these multiple texts of Scripture, all written by Paul, by the way, is that there are many ways in which we can serve God which in turn helps us to serve others. Notice what he does. He identifies the gifts, and he is very specific on the way in which these gifts should be used. For example, they should be used with humility. They should be used for the good of others. They should be used in a way that is not complicated. They should be used in a way that is to build up and not to tear down. They're to be used in a way that is connected to the role in which God has placed you or the people of God have entrusted you. God has given you these gifts. Some of these gifts are to be used very specifically within the church body. Some are used within the church body, but even more so outside of the church body. For example, the gift of evangelism is mainly targeted towards people who do not believe, whereas the gift of preaching and teaching is mainly targeted for those who do believe. And so we understand what our giftings are, and we use them as God intended us to use them. And what happens sometimes, going back to this body analogy, is that we say, well, I have a gift, and therefore it is superior to another gift. Or I have a gift, and I've watched someone else use that gift, and therefore my gift must be expressed in the same way as theirs should. And Scripture teaches that that is not true. So what are the gifts? You can look at those passages in Ephesians and Romans and Corinthians, and there's some Timothy as well, and we see these things that are spelled out. Let's go on to that question of when. When are they given? One thing we need to understand is that every believer in Jesus Christ receives the Spirit at the moment of conversion. Say, wait a minute, what's the moment of conversion? The moment of conversion is where you say to your Master and Savior Jesus Christ, I surrender my life to you, you're in charge. And when you do that, with sincerity, the Holy Spirit brings into you the Spirit of Christ and you are what Jesus would say in John, you are born again. You're born again. We all have the Spirit. No matter how young or old, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Spirit. But then we see that the Spirit does something very interesting. Now, there seem to be some gifts that lay low, if you will, for a while. God's given us these gifts and we just don't know it yet. And we're given opportunity after opportunity, and lo and behold, we realize God has just let that gift sit there for a while until we're ready to use it. We also see through experience and study of Scripture, there's moments where you just need a gift right then and there, and God says, you need this gift right then and there. Here you go. And so there is not not a better or worse. There is both. There are times when you have gifts you don't even know yet. Some of you have the gift of teaching just don't know yet because you haven't taught yet. Some of you have the gift of helps, but you're just not helping much yet. But you're going to start helping. You're going to go on a trip 
on a mission trip. You're going to go across town. You're going to see a need. And you start doing it. And you realize, you know what? I've got a lot of patience with these people. I've got a lot of compassion for these people. But the person next to me, maybe it's my spouse, maybe it's my child, maybe it's my parent, they, they don't have as much compassion as I do. It's a gift. God's given it to you. There's other times when God says, you need this gift right now. Maybe it's a triage moment. And God says, you need this. Here you go. Some of you have experienced this. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Where God just says, you need this. That's the win. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Well, as I mentioned before, we find this context in Corinthians. We've read chapter 12. And then chapter 13 is... One of the most famous passages of Scripture I mentioned earlier, love is patient, love is kind. And that comes after a discussion where people are bragging about gifts. The specific gift they're struggling with in this passage is the gift of tongues. And, and there's this illustration or a doctrine in those texts that, that says there's people that are able to speak these languages and therefore they're, they're feeling superior, superior. And this has caused discord, discord within the church. And so he says, if you can do all these things, if you can speak all these languages, if you can do all these miraculous works, but do not have love, it counts for nothing. And so then he goes into this wonderful poem of love. Love is patient, love is kind. He goes on to say it's the greatest of these. But then in chapter 14, he comes back to his point. In chapter 14, he specifically spells out the need for gifts and why we have them. Chapter 14, verse 12. It says, since you're so eager to participate in what God is doing, why don't you concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? Hear that again. Since you're so eager to participate in what God is doing, why don't you concentrate, concentrate, concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? What is the ultimate purpose of spiritual gifts? To help the church. And by the church, we mean the kingdom of God. We learn from this, therefore, that if someone has the gift, again, to use the example of evangelism, their task is to help people come into the kingdom of God. There are people who do not have the gift of clear speech, and they cannot communicate well. Even if they know their, their mother tongue well, it just doesn't come out right. Well, there are people that say, I can't go out and be the next Billy Graham, but can you be the person who gives a nice cup of cold water to a thirsty person or the person who goes fishing with another person and they call on you when their wife dies? Will you be the person who cares for somebody and then they say, wow, this person actually cares. Why do they care? Why do they care? Can you be the presence of Christ outside of the church so that the people in your presence will eventually come into the presence of Christ and within the body of Christ? For those of you that have the gifts of teaching, equipping, preaching, you use those within the church. With our church, that is our pastors, that is our life group leaders. These are the people that teach our children. These are people that say, I've got a gift, and I'm going to use it. I've got a gift, and I'm going to use it. And so the question here is, not only am I interested in having spiritual gifts, but am I interested in having these gifts so that I can build up the kingdom of God? Because there is no one gift better than another. Just as for some reason my pinky toe is necessary, every single gift is necessary. I'm, I'm coming up on the second anniversary of being able to do this. Some of you are like, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> Excited about this, right? And some of you have been here a while, you know that for quite a few weeks I preach like this. Which is hard for a guy who uses his hands when he talks, right? I broke my clavicle almost two years ago. And so my arm was this for multiple weeks. And I look forward to the day when it came out of that sling. Guess what happened when it came out of that sling? Not much. <laughs> like, can you lift your arm? Yeah, I can lift my arm. Let me bend the wall walks. You know, you know all the stuff. And it just wouldn't move. Why did it not move? Because for weeks it just sat there. It did nothing. 
It just went along for the ride. It let every other part of the body do the work. I do everything one-handed. You ever tried to do everything one-handed? Not fun. They just sit there. And this is what happens sometimes with spiritual gifts. They just sit there. They just sit there. And sometimes it's not just saying, I don't want to use it. Sometimes it's because I don't even know what it is. But then you start to realize, wow, I've got some gifts. And you begin to stretch it out a little bit. And you begin to see people blessed by your ministry. And you keep going. And before you know it, you can touch the highest rung of the ladder. Because you've seen your spiritual gifts used. Now, I want to tell you some great ways to learn what that looks like. I want you to be a person who prays sincerely and say, God, would you please show me how you've gifted me? I encourage you, if you're struggling with this, and what are gifts, to, to get into passages such as 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and just read through these and say, what has God given to me? And then another great one is talk to a brother or sister who knows you well, brother or sister in the faith. And you say, you know what, I think I have this gift. And they say, no, you do not have that gift. I'm not going to tell them myself, but I ask. I did a, a spiritual gift survey this week just to do it. And I sat down with my family. I said, guess, guess which one is the lowest? And they guessed it. <laughs> I'm not telling you which one it is. Because they know me. So some of you just need to get to know it. Let me tell you another way. And write this down on your seat two card if you want to sign up for it. January 19th. January 19th is a Sunday. And uh, Dane Havard and I are going to be teaching a class called Gifted for Ministry. We're real excited about this. You know, we spent hours talking about this week. Uh, what, what does it look like to explore gifts? And how can we use this? And hint, hint, hint. We're going to tie in really well to Romans 12. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work. You walk around life and place it before God as an offering. You know, realize spiritual gifts don't come thinking, oh, no, they're going to ask me to preach. <laughs> or, oh, no, they're going to ask me to be all of a sudden just wonderful at hospitality, even though I hate having people in my home. Whatever it may be. We want to show you through the Word of God and through just sheer communication, what does it look like for you to use the gifts God has given you in your everyday life and some of those special opportunities as well to serve God. And so my prayer for you, as for me, is that we'll continue to work out our salvation, as Paul says. And the way we work it out is by using the gifts God has given us. You can go get ready to baptize you in that. It's a wonderful time to do this. And uh, as I do, again, as I said, uh, that's, these spiritual gifts are given to Christians. The first step a Christian makes after becoming a Christian is being obedient to New Testament baptism. Where they say, you know what, I want to show people I actually belong to Jesus. So maybe you're one of those people this morning who hasn't, hasn't yet done that. You haven't said, you know what, I want to let people know that I love Jesus. There's a time right now we can do that. And as we celebrate believers' baptism... Believer's baptism is that moment, as I mentioned before, where we confess publicly that we believe in Jesus Christ and are following him as a believer in him, as a person devoted to him. And we do this after belief. That's why we call it believer's baptism, obviously. But the reason, reason we do this, uh, not before someone believes, but after, is because we believe this is symbolic of that wonderful time when we're able to say, I belong to Jesus. Uh, just as it was the a pastor of my wife's church growing up that uh, pronounced us husband and wife before I put this ring on my finger. A baptism happens after we declare Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Jeanette uh, called and we had a wonderful conversation on the phone. And uh, She's been serving Jesus and she, sa she said, you know, I, I really want to be baptized. And I said, that's the right thing to do. And so I'm so excited to have her here with us this morning, and I told her it's a wonderful thing to, for her to be able to have her daughter-in-law sing, Stephanie, as we pr prepare, prepare for her baptism. So, Jeanette, would you come, and we will baptize you. Jeanette, what is your declaration of faith? Amen. Jesus is indeed Lord. 
And that because Jesus is Lord of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are buried with him in baptism. We are raised to walk in the newness of life. Raised to life in the newness of life. That means we get up and live for Jesus. So it's time for you to get up and live for, <laughs> live for Jesus. You're sent. <laughs>